The kids who lack fathers, I mean, first of all, they can find that to some degree in their friends. And that's often what fatherless boys do in particular. They, they, they go into gangs. And they generate the missing man masculinity in the gang. Well, that's not so good because, like, what the hell do they know? They, well, they don't know anything, right? They're just stupid kids and they're, like, 15 years old and their testosterone is pumping and they're trying to get the hell away from their mother, which is what they're supposed to do. And, and they're not in the right position to exercise any authority over themselves. So that's, that's not good. They can find it in education, they can find it in books, they can find it in movies, they can find it in sports heroes, and so forth, because the image of the father is fragmented and distributed among the community. But it's very, very difficult to not have a father. Without the encouragement of your father, man, the world is a dismal place. It's very difficult to be a courageous person, unless you have your father in, in body and spirit behind you. It's very de demoralizing. Like, it really kills people not to have their mother. They just don't recover from that. But, and, and I think people can recover from a fragmented father relationship, but it's the next worst thing. You know, because if your father rejects you or doesn't form a relationship with you, it's as if the spirit of civilization has left you outside the walls as of little worth. It's very difficult for people to recover from that. Our story today begins with a young boy who had his father taken from him at a very young age. A boy who grew up in an incredibly dangerous area of an incredibly dangerous world. He rose from the boneyard of Los Angeles as a damaged and confused young man with little direction and transformed from Edward Sallow of the followers to the mighty Caesar of his legion. We discussed the Boneyard in a previous video, and despite the NCR integrating it as an official state within their nation, the city is still known for its issues and likely played a part in the death of his late father. The Boneyard was also home to a group known as the Followers of the Apocalypse, which is a group dedicated to spreading medical services and education to those who need it, which is just about everyone in the Fallout universe. If Fallout had such a thing as good guys, the Followers are it. After the death of Edward's father, his mother would seek refuge for the two of them with the followers. At the time, the followers had taken over a library within the ruins of LA, where Edward's mother would offer her humble services of cooking and cleaning. Meanwhile, Edward would be taken under the wing of the followers, where he would be given the opportunity to learn how to read. If they only knew the indirect damage they would be causing, simply by passing on knowledge to this young and dangerous mind. A young Caesar was not the charismatic leader he would go on to become just yet. He was not well liked by his peers. Perhaps this was due to the fact that he had no father to emulate and he was an outsider to the followers. Then again, I am sure many children in Fallout are fatherless and the followers' altruistic and open nature likely led to many members joining from the outside. Regardless, Edward would never truly accept the followers. From a young age, he was cynical and jaded. He thought the followers to be a naive group with their mission to spread help and knowledge a foolish endeavor at best. In a way, he would prove himself right. Their kind and open nature towards himself and his mother would eventually lead to the greatest threat the very society he came from had ever known. Still, Edward would stay with the followers through his youth. It's all he had after all, all he had ever known. By the time he was 20 years old, he was a studied anthropologist and linguist. This means he was well studied in human societies, cultures, and their development as well as being a person who studies languages, particularly ones foreign to their own. This is a fascinating background for a character in Fallout. See, after the Great War, much of the West Coast United States saw the formation of isolated tribes, which developed unique languages and cultures given their lack of a unifying state. There was no United States or any some such country anymore. Hundreds of years had passed, and people had changed their ways to fit their circumstances. Today, we might hear of an anthropologist and think of someone studying ancient cultures long washed away by the sands of time. We hear of a linguist and think they must need to travel far and wide to experience the languages of nations separated by mountains, oceans, and otherwise. Caesar, however, merely needed to cross California's borders to find a vast array of small, isolated societies throughout the American Southwest in which his particular skill set was immensely useful for. And so, the followers sent him this way, towards the Grand Canyon, a massive chasm in the earth that runs through northwestern Arizona. He would not be alone in this coming-of-age journey, however. The size of this party is not known exactly, 
but it is known that a physician named Bill Calhoun would be sent with him out of the followers of the apocalypse, and they would eventually meet up with a particular Mormon missionary and tribal specialist named Joshua Graham. On their journey, Edward would discover some old world books, and in this culminating moment where his young ambitious mind would meet the words and ideas of a world long forgotten, perhaps the followers' greatest mistake would be brought to light. Of the books he found, two would have their lasting impact. The first was The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is not just any random history book you might get slammed on your desk in high school, as the writing combines historical narrative and philosophical reflections as it covers a wide range of Roman and further European history. It is known for having set a standard for being a well-constructed narrative in particular, which is why it may have latched onto Sallow's young and impressionable mind. The work is detailed and exhaustive, covering political, military, social, and economic aspects of the empire's history. The second book that would leave its mark on Sallow was Commentary de Bello Gallico, by Julius Caesar himself. This text is a personal account of Julius Caesar's military campaign in Gaul, which consists of modern day France and Belgium. He details his strategies, tactics, and his thoughts with detailed descriptions of the Gaelic Wars, along with the geography, region, tribes, and events of the time. Interestingly enough, the text includes ethnographic descriptions of the Gaelic tribes with their customs and social structures. It would appear that Edward and Julius shared some things in common even before the forming of the Legion. The text would also serve as an example to Edward about the power of political propaganda, as this text helped Julius Caesar bolster his reputation and political standing in Rome. How dangerous might it be for a man in a position of immense power to write his own history, write his own story, with no checks, no balances, unrivaled? The waves of his writing would have an effect so far-reaching it would touch the mind of a man over 2,000 years into the future on the other end of an apocalypse. Unfortunately for the party Edward traveled with, a tribe they were spending time with would turn hostile, likely due to a mistranslation oddly enough. They were now hostages of the Blackfoot tribe. The name potentially being a reference to the real-life Blackfoot Confederacy, a group of Native American tribes from the Great Plains of North America. The young and well-read Sala would notice that the Blackfoot tribe was at war with many other tribes and failing at that. He used his understanding of firearms, explosives, and unit tactics from books he had read to teach the Blackfoot tribe how to properly conduct warfare. He would set their sights on their weakest enemy first after the naive tribe made Sala their war chief. This tribe was known as the Ridgers, and they would refuse to surrender to Sala's Blackfoot tribe. Sallow's brutality would come on full display very quickly in his new position of power. His transformation into Caesar was already occurring, and he would have every man, woman, and child killed. Not a single exception was made within the Ridgers. When Caesar set the Blackfoot tribe on their next enemy in the Kaibabs, they would show similar resistance to defeat despite being outmatched. Caesar would take a Kaibab envoy to the Ridgers village where they had been exterminated. The Kaibabs were immediately terrified of his brutality after seeing what he had done to the Ridgers. They had not seen something of this nature before. They knew battle, they knew fighting, but they did not know the genocide Caesar laid before them, a threat indicating their fate if they did not submit to him. Thus, they folded, and so did the next tribe, and the next, and the next, all bowing down to Caesar many being consumed in the process, weakened from their original state, but strengthened when combined, eventually leading to the formation of the great tribe of the Legion. Upon considering what caused all the fighting among the tribes, Caesar would focus on wiping out their previous cultural identity and unifying them under one. He would rely on their ignorance of European history and their illiteracy to implement the ideas he had gained from the texts he found at the start of this venture. So now we're left with the question, what became of the original group Sallow had set out with? Well, Bill Calhoun, his original partner, would be sent back as an emissary to the followers in the NCR with a warning. He had garnered enough strength and maintained enough distance to announce himself to the greatest nation in the wastes. This is reminiscent of Volpe sending the courier back to the Mojave outpost to warn the NCR that the Legion is near after their attack on Nipton fear tactics, and bravado at play. 
The rest of them would not be so lucky, as they would be killed, likely despising what Edward had become given they were either followers or Mormon missionaries who would challenge his authority and actions, all killed except for Joshua Graham, who would find himself at Caesar's right hand, becoming the Malpace Legate. A legatus was a high-ranking officer in the Roman army and also a term used for a diplomatic envoy in the Roman Republic and Empire. For Caesar, they act similarly to a general of his army and an extension of his power and image of supremacy. Now is where his true conquest begins. He would completely take over Arizona and New Mexico, with each tribe in the way being forced to assimilate. Interestingly, however, surviving cities and towns within the regions would carry on as subjects of his empire, an area we do not get to explore in game, though seeing how these towns exist would be fascinating. They are noted for being quite safe from threats such as raiders, a luxury a young Caesar was not afforded while living inside the borders of the NCR. The Legion would also go on to secure portions of Utah and Colorado, and a capital for the Legion would be established in Flagstaff, Arizona, a relatively small city known for its natural wonders. He had torn through the American Southwest with little resistance, becoming known as the Conqueror of 86 Tribes. The depth of their society goes further, however, as the megalomaniac would deem himself the son of Mars, the Roman god of war. Mars is also associated with agriculture and fertility, reflecting his origins as a more complex deity than his Greek counterpart Ares. He is often depicted as the father of Romulus and Remus, the legendary founders of Rome. Mars was considered a protector of Rome, and his worship was integral to the Roman state religion. Caesar's legion would worship Mars, and thus his son as well. They believed that it was Mars who cleansed the earth and fire, referring to the nuclear annihilation of the Great War. He did so to make way for his son, Caesar, to conquer this new world. This makes Caesar a deity in the eyes of his legion, and imbues them with a sense of strength, knowing they are backed by a god. This is why they are so willing to give their life to Caesar. It's not that they just believe in his cause, they believe in him. Romans believed that those who died heroically in battle were granted a place of honor in the afterlife. These fallen warriors were thought to join the ranks of heroic spirits or be received in the Elysian fields, a part of the underworld reserved for the virtuous and heroic. Children taken into the legion are raised by priestesses who indoctrinate them into this cult. They are raised with this notion that their leader is a god as truth. This helps remove previous cultures and unify them under one, under Caesar. Furthermore, this directs their cause at those who they see as weak and wicked, justifying their conquest to rid the wasteland of its chaos and barbarism, a term used by ancient Rome simply to demonize those who were not Roman. We'll continue into the story of the Legion and Caesar himself in another video, as there is much to cover but we can see here just how much this faction draws upon our real life history and uses this base to create an incredibly interesting faction in the Fallout universe. It's easy to view this faction as a comically evil group who enslaves, destroys, and consumes at their will, yet they draw inspiration from real people and real events who are often glorified and romanticized. The Legion are known for having suffered significant cut content due to New Vegas's short development cycle, but what is already here before us has more to it than meets the eye. I am drawn to this faction for its flaws, for its absurdity, and for its historical connection, but most of all, I am drawn to it for its stories that lie within. The tragic story of a child who grew up in a harsh world and lost his father, who grew into a terrible harsh man who most players kill the first chance they get. The tribes who serve him, whose only claim to innocence is their ignorance, and the oddly fitting recreation of an ancient society that has found a place and purpose in a brutal wasteland. Thanks for watching, and until next time. It's where me life has meaning with responsibility. The more responsibility you take on, the more meaning your life has, and the, the higher degree of responsibility that you agree voluntarily to try to bear, the richer your life will be. And no one's ever told that, and it's the case. You know, it's like you have, you have four kids, say. Well, that's plenty of responsibility. You're gonna have meaning. It's gonna be rough, you know, because it's complicated. You have a complicated job and you try to help the careers of the people around you. You try to solve tough problems and aid suffering and do all of that. It's like, it's weight. 
it's responsibility, but it's, there's glory in it. There's real glory in it. There's deep meaning in it. And, and, and young people are starving for that because no one ever tells them that. It's like, you're way more than you think. Man, stand up, do something difficult. Do something difficult and heroic, right? Burst out of your bonds. It's like, that's a good message. It's a necessary message. Because we have to be more than we are, because if we, if we aren't, we're not going to survive. <laughs>